Hey everyone, it's Jim and Charles from Valves and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 202, we're going to talk a little bit about inrush voltage surge. What it is and why it's important. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Well, a short while back, we looked at inrush current. And today, we're going to look at the other part to this, and that's the accompanying inrush voltage surge. Basically, what happens when you turn on your tube amp is the tubes start to lamp and the capacitors start to fill up. But until the tube filaments are at their normal operating temperature, the tubes won't start to conduct. Well, they start to conduct slowly as the filaments start to warm up. Anyways, all of that leads to elevated B plus or high voltage. On top of that, the capacitors and tube filaments will create a current spike. In the case of the capacitors, the time to fill the caps will be very short, but the filaments will take a little longer to level off. That's why it's very important to spec out the transformers, capacitors, resistors, and fuses, and any other build components to account for this current and voltage spike. Now, normal conservative practice dictates that every component has a <laughs> I knew I was going to screw that up. Has a design safety margin. This margin will depend on the circuit, component, and operating conditions. A good example of that is resistors, especially in the power supply. We usually try to make sure they're at least rated for double, but sometimes even more. Yeah. In fact, I. I I consider when I, I do a lot of the specking out for the kit amps and I consider two times to be an absolute minimum for, um, uh, for a wattage rating on a resistor. And also that can shift as well. So if a resistor is rated for a certain amount of watts, that will be very dependent on the temperature that it's sitting at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a good point because operating conditions, as we previously message, <laughs> pre previously message, <laughs> let's see if I can do it right this time. Operating conditions, as previously mentioned, um, there we go, <laughs> can make a huge difference, um, uh, particularly with um, uh, power resistors and. Um, with uh, uh, components like uh, MOSFET transistors, holy moly, uh, uh, as they warm up, their um, their their current handling drops sharply. <laughs> yeah. So, anyways, and that's it's it's actually quite common for a lot of components. Um, so, now on our lab bench, I've got our most popular kit, the Universal six or twelve SN seven preamp, and um, and this is actually, uh, I believe, the, proto the actual prototype build. So it's not quite finished. It doesn't have a recessed um, bottom plate here. But other than that, it's pretty much basically the same. And we're just using it as a test platform. So what we've done is two things. So Charles has gone and hooked up uh, one, of the volt one, of one of our little voltmeters onto the B+. And that... Let me get a pointer. Never stick a finger in an amp, even if you're pretty sure it's yeah. off. We have made it safe, but it's always good practice. Yeah, so so this is non-conductive. So you can come in here even live and poke around. Um, though I don't recommend you do that. Um, so here is, here's the power supply board. This is a dual mono design. So it's got a separate power supply for each channel. And of course, a board for each channel. And this is the B plus or high voltage coming off of the power supply. So what we've done is we've clipped in right here. And of course, we brought a connection to a, a good solid ground point, which is down here. Uh, in fact, the entire top plate is a, is a, um, a ground plane. It's a ground plane. So, um, and we've also tapped into, you can't see it, but over here on the other side of the IEC, 
is the um, is the power cord. And what we've done is we actually tapped into the hotline, and we're running it through an AND meter. And you'll see that um, up on the corner of your screen. Yeah, we're taking a separate recording, and uh, I'll just overlay them here in a bit. Now, what we've done is we've set the meters up so that they're they're ready to capture um, the maximum surge in voltage and in current. And um, uh, you'll see on each screen that we've got one is set up for DC voltage, right? That's what we what that's what basically every amplifier runs on. Yeah, you're, you supply an AC mains, but then you rectify it into DC, right? And then the whole, it doesn't matter whether it's a solid state amp or a tube amp, you're going to be, your circuit actually runs on DC. And you're also going to see uh, one of the meters is set for ACA. So that's AC amps, which is, of course, our, our, mains, our mains power supply on the IEC cord. Okay. So, Charles, uh, are you all set? What are, what are my jobs to do here? Okay, so you're responsible for turning on the heater and the B plus at the same time, and we should see that voltage spike we were talking about, yeah. along with the current spike, and then we're going to see them slowly shift to their normal operating point. Now, a lot of our preamps, um, in fact, a lot of our kits, use an independent filament supply that's a switch mode power supply that are typically just called SMPSs or even power bricks. That's what you power up your laptop with and probably a dozen other... Oh, they're used everywhere. Everywhere. Um, you know, small ones are... are, are um, uh, used for your phones, yeah. uh, tablets, yeah, yeah, you name it. So normally uh, what we would do uh, to reduce uh, inrush um, surge is that we would we would turn on the high voltage and then we would turn on the filaments and what that does is it allows for um, a slow startup basically because the tubes take a little bit of time to warm up but for the point for demonstration purposes what i'm going to do is i'm going to turn on both at the same time which is very typical of most gear there won't be any delay in a lot of equipment so when you turn on your your tube preamp or your tube amplifier, in many cases, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be turning on the high, the, the, the high voltage and the filaments both at the exact same time. And that's what we'll demonstrate here. Now, that doesn't happen with every amplifier. Some of them have different methods for preventing the B-plus from getting to the tube before they're fully heated up. There's all sorts of different tricks and things that people do. Yeah, before. so with some, particularly vintage gear, uh, because of capacitor ratings, they might actually do it backwards. And so they might actually start up the filaments and, and then hit the high voltage. To prevent that voltage surge from happening. But yeah. then they get a larger current surge as a result. That's right. And uh, with some vintage gear, the reason they did that is because big capacitors were incredibly expensive. Wow you know, compared to a resistor. <laughs> and frankly, they were just being cheap. And uh, so to get around that, or get around having to put a higher voltage cap in circuit, um, th they ended up um, uh, having to start up, having a, a starting procedure for the amplifier that was very specific to that particular amp. So the general, the, the, the rule with all gear, whether it's vintage or modern, is read your manual and follow those uh, turn-on instructions. And, and uh, there, there's also even some tubes that, was, uh, that were used in older equipment that were relays, believe it or not, that would cause a slow startup to happen and then they would close a connection after they had heated up for a certain amount of time and cause the B-plus to become live or whatever else you wanted. Yeah, and there's a lot of I mean, we could make six episodes talking about slow start methods. Thermistors are a very common product. And basically what that is, is a resistor in the power supply early on. And what it what that resistor does is slowly um, open up uh, the, uh, the flow of power. Yeah, as it warms up, its resistance drops. Yeah. So, but... As I said, there's 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 multiple ways of approaching this. In many cases, um, a lot of uh, gear can be designed to simply um, operate 
with a turn on and that just means the components are spec properly we'll look at that in just a moment anyways this is getting boring so <laughs> let's do the demonstration <laughs> okay so i'm ready are you ready okay let's just connect up this meter and we're good to go all right there's that voltage surge and the current and in case you can't see the maximum voltage and current on your screen here. It might be a little too small. I'll, I'll overlay it if I have to. And here we can see the voltage is now starting to drop as the tubes heat up. So we can see there was a max of 321 volts DC and we're already dropping about 45, 46 volts. And what was our max current surge? on startup? Uh, 417 milliamps, so almost half an amp, and we're all the way down at 56 milliamps now, so huge difference. Yeah, so that lets you know why um, fuses um, are oversized to, to... And slow blow. <laughs> and slow blow in many cases. Sometimes they need to be fast blow, but in a lot of cases on tube gear uh, in particular, uh, we're running slow blows and ceramic fuses as well. And uh, we'll, we'll take a look at a couple of those components when we, we get done with all this voltage and current testing. Yeah, so there we go. So it looks like we're, we're just about stable here. There's going to be just a tiny bit more shift, but we have, let's say, 47 volts difference between the peak and what we're settling on on the preamp here. So that might not sound like a whole lot, but, you know, with capacitor ratings the way they are, you really don't want to get anywhere close to that peak number on your cap because over time it will probably damage it. Okay, well that was fun. Let's let's grab a few components and we'll just take a look at them. Okay, so we've pulled a selection of components here for you to take a look at in all different ratings. And we're gonna start by looking at these electrolytic capacitors. And this is one of the standard filter caps we would use with our kit amps. This is a 330 microfarad rated for 450 volts. And the, this is made by Nishikan. It's a quality manufacturer of capacitors. And the one right next to it is actually rated for the same capacitance. It might be a little hard to see it on there. However, this is a much lower rated at 35 volts. So even though they're the same capacitance, they are very different in terms of their voltage rating. So you can tell right away that this one is meant for heavier duty. Well, oh, higher voltage. Anyways. Higher voltage, yeah. So after that, we have a coupling cap. And this is um, rated for 100 volts DC. However, and just like these guys, these are all DC ratings on them. If you're gonna be using it for something that is an AC purpose, like you would have a coupling cap for where you want it to pass AC, you actually have to derate this 100 volt DC for the AC. And what do you derate it by? Uh, roughly 40%. Um, now, every component that goes into any uh, electrical circuit will have a source specification sheet or a data sheet. So if, if you're not 100% sure or your spec is a little bit closer than you'd like, you can go ahead and look up the data sheet for pretty much every, um, every component that um, would, you would be working with. And that data sheet will tell you everything you need to know. So the data sheet always rules, but if you have a lot of experience when you're uh, specking components like we do, um, I'll just simply rely on experience. And you normally don't have a huge selection uh, available. So you're not gonna have uh, a 450 volt, a 400 volt, uh, 350 volt they move in fairly large increments so the next size down that's really quite common is going to be i think 250 volts and that's next, a big shift yeah and the next size up is 550 volts and of course there's a huge price difference uh on each voltage rating okay what else have we got charles all right well here's some of the standard fuses we would use with our kits and fuses come in voltage and current ratings so whenever you're setting up or you're choosing a fuse for your device you want to make sure that it's rated not just to handle the standard amount of current and voltage you're putting through it but also to handle the surge and these are actually slow blow so they can get fairly close to their ratings and not pop right away 
Yeah, there are also ceramic encased filaments, and what that does is is the filament runs essentially through a solid material, so that if it does if it does break, so if there's a if there's a catastrophic failure of the circuit, um, if um, for whatever reason the uh, filament in the fuse breaks, it's it's a lot less likely for um, for an arc to happen across the terminals here. Um, and again, the fuses uh, that you use will have a specification and let you know what those uh, what those what those specs are. Mm -hmm. Now things are a little bit different once we get to resistors. So resistors are generally rated in watts. And what's a watt? Well, if you follow Ohm's law, it's just voltage times current. So if you raise your voltage that's going through it, you have to drop your current to keep the same wattage rating or keep within it. So we have a one watt here. You can see we get bigger as we go up to a two watt, even bigger still up to a five watt. And this is a ceramic encased one that's designed to stand up for better heat dissipation. And then we have another five watt in a different style here. These are RX 21s, I believe they're called, or 27s. I think those might be 10 watts. Ah, yes, you're right. That is a 10 watt resistor. And finally, we have this chunky 50 watt over here. And you can see this one even has, let me get that in focus, has this aluminum heat sink around it. So it will help it dissipate heat because resistors, as they heat up, their ratings will go down fairly dramatically. So you want to try and keep them cool. Yeah, and as resistors get into the larger case sizes, they're typically called power resistors. Whereas something like this, which is a metal film resistor, you'll find everywhere and um, in in a larger variety of values yeah and of course the, I, we don't have any surface mount components here but a lot of uh, of of modern electronics um, such as your phone are going to be absolutely filled with um, very very tiny surface mount resistors and and capacitors and everything else you could imagine but they're still going to have the same ratings so why all this matters is is Good quality components will lead to um, that are well specced and will lead to um, better sound quality, will lead to uh, greater safety of operation, and uh, in, in many cases, uh, spending a little bit more at the beginning of the manufacturing process and putting high quality components in uh, are, is going to lead to a much longer lived. Uh, amplifier and um, in today's uh, throwaway world it it's a real problem because uh, in, unless you're actually working on something like one of our kit amps which is very repairable and they're generally built in a in a mostly modular fashion mostly modular fashion and because they're designed to be assembled by some somebody who's just a beginner on a home uh, bench they're uh, relatively easy to put together and relatively easy to take apart to work on and that's just not the case with um, with a lot of manufactured electronics these days and in at the end of the day um, it's worth spending a little bit more money on what you buy to buy something that's well made with good quality components because it'll live a lot lot longer than something that isn't and if it's repairable by you that's even better yeah, so hopefully this helps inform you a little bit because better quality manufacturers, um, not just kit amp manufacturers, but electronics manufacturers will actually put pictures of the interior assembly of the of the component. And they're really generous, they'll even publish some schematics for you too. That's very rare, Charles. <laughs> oh, I did say generous. <laughs> I think we're one of the few kit amp manufacturers in the world that have that have ever uh, concurrently published um, complete schematics um, with uh, every design we release. Um, with vintage equipment, you can often find uh, the schematics that would have been part of the service and repair manuals, but... Um, Sometimes even inside the device itself. Yeah. So anyways, choose, choose your components, choose your components carefully and choose the equipment you buy carefully. Um, and uh, it'll pay off in the end. 
Okay, Charles, I think we've got uh, at least one nice tube that came in to show off. Yeah, let's clear the deck and get it out here. Okay, well, it's been a slow, slow week. Summer tends to be like this. We've actually been really busy um, on our lab benches because we were developing a whole series of prototypes that will eventually lead to um, a couple of new kit amps in what we're calling the modern line. And yeah, so, but what did come in are, um, are a small bunch of probably the best EL34s ever made. Now these are branded Sylvania, but there's some easy clues to figure out that in fact, these are true vintage Mullard XF2s. And the first thing that you can see here is that there's a hole in the middle of the guide pin and um, up here where the, the uh, mica mounts in the glass, there's a little gap between where the little claws are and where they're not. In this case, it's a single getter. There's actually a double getter version of this. I'm not too keen on the double getter versions. Uh, I, we actually focused a number of years ago on just the single getter version. I think um, these are longer, a longer lived tube though. The difference is I actually logged <laughs> for a long time. I logged the double getter version and the single getter version to look at testing numbers and year of manufacture. And there's really not that much of a difference, but I wouldn't mix them up in a quad if I was putting together a quad though it probably wouldn't hurt anything. Now, if you look down here though, at the waist of all of the XF2s, there's an etching on the glass. So you can see the XF2. So that's the second series of the Mullard EL34s. And then over here, you've got a capital B. Where's my poker, Charles? Yeah, I think it's on your right over there. Ah. Okay. And capital B, uh, that stands for Blackburn UK. So that was, uh, that was the main Mullard plant, though they had a number of, of, of good sized plants um, in the UK. And we've got here, we've got a two. So that's the digit of the year code. So these tubes were made roughly mm, 19... I think it was mid 1960s. No, no, I'm gonna say about 1960 to about 1973. And um, this is, this is, looking like late production. So I'm going to say this is a 1972. And then we have a D. So that's the month code. So that gets us to April, right? And a four. So that was the fourth week of April, 1972 in the Blackburn plant. Now, etch codes you would think are um, really solid and would stand up the test of time, but they're not. They'll actually um, wiped down quite easily. So a lot of uh, tube wholesalers really like to clean things up and as a result they'll just wipe this right off and sometimes you can actually get a hint of the code and sometimes it's just lost forever. So if you're cleaning tubes be really careful around the manufacturing codes. You don't want to lose those, absolutely not. Yeah and that code structure was made by Phillips who owned Mullard so all Phillips tubes out there, or most of them, should have that code on there. So yeah. you have to be careful about yeah, it. Yeah, it doesn't matter if the Phillips plant was in Germany, the UK, uh, Canada, France. It, it yeah. doesn't matter. It'll have a factory code. It'll have um, it'll have a type code, and it'll have uh, the rest of this. There's a couple of versions depending on what year the the tubes are made, but you can actually find. Uh, the code um, uh, decode sheet, if yep. you want to call it that, online. They're they're quite commonly available, and um, and it'll help out. Now this looks very much like a new old stock tube, and it probably is, but it won't be until we get it on our custom power tube tester that we'll know whether or not we'll actually um, officially call this new old stock, or whether we'll call it good used. Or, I mean, it's even possible that it's garbage, but... Um, Hopefully not. <laughs> when you look at a tube like this uh, and you want to assess, before you do anything with it, you want to take a look at the pins. What is the condition of the pins? 
They can have a small amount of wear if they're new old stock because they've gone probably into a number of testers over the years. But the guide pin should be relatively clean. It can have a few little marks, but it should not show high wear. If it has high wear on it, then that's a, that's a good indicator that the tube has seen a lot of use. The other thing that you want to look for is how solid is the gettering. So this is normal for an XF2. And as you can see, it is basically perfect. If it was, if it had deteriorated a little bit through uh, use or a long period of time, even in storage, um, you would see a little receding here on the le on the edge, or even a lot. And so you'll see it receding up like this, and you'll see the chrome fading. So good chrome is solid. Lighter chrome is a sign of use or deterioration. And that can happen in storage if the vacuum isn't solid, because this maintains your vacuum. That's why it's so important. Once the vacuum is gone or almost gone, a power tube will pop really quickly. So if you have a power tube in which the gathering is almost gone completely, it's probably a good idea to retire the tube before it red plates or possibly damages your amp. Um, so that's always one good indication. And of course, if you have any indication of problems whatsoever, particularly if the bias of the power tube uh, doesn't stay steady, that's, that is a very strong indication that you've got a problem and those power tubes should be retired. Yeah, don't leave them running in your system, especially not unattended. Yeah, absolutely not. So caution is the rule of the day, particularly with vacuum tubes and the higher the power of the tube and an EO34 is a fairly high powered power tube, the more caution you exercise. Okay, well, if you stay to the very end, here's some discount codes to help you out. Now, there's, um, there's a, an easy to figure out cheers code and that a lot of people have been getting, particularly this year. So we've been handing out a lot of nice discounts and there's a really big cheers code. So I gave a good hint, I think, was it last week or the week before we showed off um, some true vintage Svetlana 6550Cs, new old stock, which is, I, you know... We can't I've, remember the last time we found them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, we specialize in the, in the Svetlana 6550C and KT88. That's the true vintage Svets um, for years now. And we get so few new old stock uh, 6550s in that we actually just blend them into the use sets. Um, but this time we found a lot of new old stock tubes. Um, and unfortunately, they're expensive. And that's where the Cheers codes can help out. Anyways, this is Jim. And Charles. Signing off. Stay safe, everyone. And enjoy the last days of summer. Cheers, everyone.